Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Paranormal Nothing podcast. I'm Juan Quiroz, the founder and uh, host of this podcast and of the Paranormal Nothing, I guess you would call it a uh, page or, uh, you know, experience or um, company, however you want to call it. But uh, it's been a while, months, I, I think, since my last podcast. Uh, a lot of things got in the way. A lot of life goes on. I've been very, very busy over these last few months, but if you're a member of the uh, Facebook group, the Paranormal Nothing community, you'll see that I haven't um, stopped posting, you know, so there's there's been so much paranormal news. And again, for this, for new new listeners of uh, this podcast, uh, this podcast is basically what I like to call an intersection, the intersection of the of mainstream science and the paranormal. So anything related to those two topics especially where they intersect, that's where that's where we will actually get into um, through all the different uh, pages that I have, um, social media, and then in this podcast, and, and again, even on my YouTube channel. So for this podcast, I wanted to talk a little bit about data science. So it's kind of a little bit of my background, and um, it's a big thing now in technology. You know, if you've heard the term big data, um, or if you heard of the term even uh, something called machine learning or uh, uh, artificial intelligence, you'll kind of know that what, what all those terms essentially mean are that we, we now have an enormous amount of data available in the world on the net. Uh, it could be mined. It could be what uh, the term, the term is typically called scraped from the, from web pages, from backend uh, servers, from um, SQL, using a language called SQL or some other languages as well for data science, uh, where you can actually scrape the web for a variety of um, frequent terms, a variety of frequent um, images even when it comes to AI. Um, but it, but that's just the very, very pinnacle, a very high level of what data science is. But it can actually be used to predict. So that's where things such as AI and machine learning come into play, particularly with statistics. So if you're familiar with t statistics, you know that statistics could be used potentially for creating, um, you know, they, they could create uh, portrayals or pictures of things that maybe aren't necessarily true. Um, but they could also tell us a really good prediction of something that might happen in the future based on a variety of variables and observable data. So the reason that I kind of wanted to talk about data science in today's episode is because I recently came about an article from a website called Mind Matters. Mind Matters. Um, the website is called mindmatters.ai. And um, I, d I post about, you know, about this website quite often on, in my uh, Paranormal Nothing group uh, on Facebook. Again, if, you don't, if you're not a member and if you'd like to be a member, uh, a link is in the show notes, and it's also in the um, site for for my YouTube channel, or even on the site for any of the pod in any of the uh, podcast apps you're listening to. If you're listening to this podcast, it's on there as well. I no longer have the paranormalnothing.com. I think I was just kind of redundant, um, and I I didn't want to waste any more money in uh, you know maintaining it and uh, paying for the service. So I've gone ahead and removed it. So anything related to the paranormal nothing will be found on Twitter or on Facebook group um, and the Facebook page. I don't longer have Instagram because I just kind of found it a waste of time. Um, it was getting way too esoteric, way too fringe. Nothing against those people, but um, that's not the point of this podcast. You know, I really wanted to stick to hard science and hard science with the intersection of the paranormal. So if you want to find anything related to the paranormal, nothing, again, those are your avenues. But going back to this Mind Matters article, the title of the article was Data Analyst Offers 15 Reasons Extraterrestrials Aren't Seen. So the data analyst that's referenced, the name is Young Lin Ma. And the date of the article is actually August 21st, 2021. So it is not a recent article. You know, it's a little less than a year old. But what struck me is the headline data analyst, right? So, of course, you know, I went ahead and looked up this person, Jun, um, Young Lin Ma, and it looks like the article on Mind Matters is being referenced from another, from a source article, um, 
on Medium, medium medium.com. So in medium.com, we don't see too much about Young Lin Ma either. So basically all it says is that Young Lin Ma is a contributor to medium.com and that uh, he's basically, you know, there's a little picture about this person and it says data analyst at a sizable multinational company. So whatever that means, that's who Young Lin Ma is. Uh, he has 86 followers, and there's um, actually a reference to his LinkedIn page uh, that you can actually look up, um, but there's nothing there. Uh, so there's nothing really on LinkedIn on this guy. Um, I, I've done some searches for him too. So I don't know again about the reputation of this data analyst, Young Lin Ma, but it looks like in Medium, he has posted quite a few articles. So he is a quite a frequent contributor uh, to to um, to medium so if you're familiar with medium.com it is I, I like to call it a kind of a more of a formal reddit reddit type of platform where you can actually write articles that look very very legitimate but they are they are all opinion uh, so i'm assuming that medium does kind of vet these articles but they are all you know written by i guess you would call it uh amateur authors you know amateur journalists per se so Young Lin Ma has written quite a few articles on a variety of topics from uh, one article is called The Origins of Freemasonry and the Illuminati. Another article is called If the Earth Loses the Moon. Another, art- another article is How Big is the Universe? So it looks like he himself is kind of in between those, you know, the blurring the lines between hard data science, hard science, and and the paranormal, the esoteric, when it comes to the stuff he writes about. But Regardless, you know, but again, you want to, whenever you're encountering an article that's propon- proponing or, you know, proposing to to kind of answer the big question, which is the Fermi paradox, right? We really want to vet that article. So that's what his article is basically saying. Uh, he's giving 15 reasons why we haven't seen ET. And essentially, that's the answer to the Fermi paradox. So, right, if you're familiar with the Fermi paradox, Enrico Fermi, Very famous physicist said, if the universe is full of aliens, where are they? Uh, Why haven't we seen them? So there's there's a variety of solutions to the Fermi paradox, some more famous than others. There's, of course, the dark forest hypothesis. There's, of course, um, you know, the, uh, the, um, I I guess I would like to call it the the zoo hypothesis, uh, which we'll get into in a bit. There's the uh, rare contact hypothesis. So there's quite a few that are more well known, but this guy, he, uh, you know, I guess the article gives him a little bit of cred- uh, uh, credentials uh, because he is a da- data analyst. So I'm not sure if he applied data science to come up with these terms, but you know, if, if he is a data analyst, I, I, whenever I see something, an article written by somebody who knows data, then hopefully they will be using data to actually talk about whatever they're going to talk about in the article. So I wanted to just kind of talk about this article in today's podcast since I I found it interesting. Again, it's a recent article. And um, I know, you know, again, recently we've heard quite a few things in the news about UFOs. Of course, we've got just a few weeks ago the uh, hearing that took place on Capitol Hill, the one-day hearing on UFOs. I'm about three-fourths of the way listening to it, and I'm very, very disappointed. Uh, basically, all it is is a few officials saying that, you know, that they are now going to be taking UFO seriously. I guess that they didn't in the past, but now they are going to. They showed a couple of videos that, you know, made made the news at some point, uh, but they didn't have any eyewitnesses. They didn't have anybody from, you know, like the people such as David Fravor or even uh, Louis, Louis Elizondo. Uh, any any of those names, um, Christopher Mellon would have been good. Any of those names were, were not on there. Basically, what these hearings were is just for the government to recognize that maybe UFOs weren't taken seriously. Now they are, and there should be no stigma behind somebody reporting a UFO. Whether or not, you know, that's going to continue being the case, who knows? But um, But that's been in the news. So, And then, of course, you know, we know recently that JWST, um, James Webb Space Telescope, uh, was launched, you know, a few months ago. 
and it's continuing to reach out, right? I mean, this summer, we're ho hoping to have the first actual science to take place uh, using the telescope. I know we got an image not that long ago. And just recently, like last week, there was an article that I talked about in my group in the Char Paranormal Nothing uh, community that said that a group of scientists were able to pinpoint, have been able to pinpoint the source of the very famous 1977 wow signal. So if you're not familiar with that wow signal, um, this it's basically a a uh, sequence of uh, of a signal that lasted 72 seconds, and it was so it looked so artificial on on the paper at that time that the scientist that was there, Jerry Air, Jerry Airman, basically wrote the word wow on the paper, saying that this must be something. This this is too good to be true. However, at that time, they were never able to identify where that signal came from. Uh, they were never able to ident they were never able to um, find it again, and uh, you know they I guess they kind of attributed it to potentially some kind of interference local um, to our, to Earth, but not necessarily extraterrestrial. Well, just recently there's been a in a paper by written by astronomer Alberto Caballero from uh, European Space Agency ESA using Gaia, Gaia data. Um, he he's been able to actually pinpoint the location of this wow signal. So the location of the wow signal again, how, how did he do it? Uh, well, the paper goes into it in quite detail, but it's basically a star called 2 mass 1928-1982-2640-123. So it's a really very, very technical paper, um, and he gives a location of the star um, that apparently might be the source of this uh, wow signal. So again, we see that in the news. So with so much of this information now out and about, I thought, well, it's interesting, you know, that the reason I came up, I came across this article about data analysts, you know, propo proposes uh, solutions to the Fermi paradox is, well, sometimes, you know, I feel like we're kind of slowly fed some information in order to prep us for some kind of announcement. I like to think that um, we're kind of being told that, hey, now there's a source for the wow signal and it's a star, um, you know, not that far away from us, but it's a star nevertheless that we know exists and it might be a candidate for uh, for actually being a source of a artificial, some type of artificial signal. So let me just read you the abstract from that paper. And again, this paper was just recently released um, Alberto Caballero, it says, In this paper, it is analyzed which of the thousands of stars in the WOW signal region could have had the highest chance of being the real source of the signal, providing that it came from a star system similar to ours. A total of 66 G and K type stars are sampled, but only one of them is identified. As a potential sun-like star, considering the available information in the Gaia archive, this candidate source, which is named 2MASS and then the number, therefore becomes an ideal target to conduct observations in the search for potentially habitable exoplanets. Another two candidate stars have a luminosity error interval that includes the luminosity of the Sun, and 14 candidates more are also identified as potential Sun-like stars, but the estimates in their luminosity were unknown. So as you can see, WOW signal might be a candidate already that... Uh, you know, might be something to point the uh, breakthrough listen at, or uh, maybe point J JWST at those stars to see if there's there's something there. So that signal took you know again 43 years. That's a long time. But again, is the reason why they haven't contacted us? What is the reason? If there is somebody over there near that star that sent us that signal that we happen to come across, why hasn't it been replicated? Um, why haven't we heard it again? And you know, it, was it was it some was it kind of a, a signal from a dying civilization that maybe are is no longer around? So that's basically what the um, the the this article is about. So let me go real quick through through these items. So the first solution he talks about uh, again, Young Lin Ma talks about that data provides apparently that the reasons why we haven't heard from ET. 
First solution is, of course, the very famous dark forest hypothesis. So we know that there's a very famous series of books. The three-body problem is the first one. Dark forest is the second book. And I think there's a third book. I haven't read it. I'm on, I'm on the dark forest still, so I don't know the title. But it's written by a very famous author named Lou Sisson. And um, if you haven't read the three-body problem, if you're very interested in this type of stuff, which I think you are since you're listening to this podcast, definitely pick it up. Maybe I might do an episode on it in the future. But basically that dark forest hypothesis, what it says is that, uh, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to show ourselves. Uh, E.T. wouldn't want to show itself because if we do, chances are one of us will destroy each other. So we live in a dark forest. Um, we live in, in, in a type of uh, the idea of a dark forest, almost like a uh, an imaginary dark forest where neither one of us wants to show themselves because war will ensue and will cause uh, the elimination the elim- elimination of either race or either civilization. So essentially we choose to live in a dark forest. That's, that's that hypothesis. A uh, second hypothesis that Young Lin Ma gives is that maybe that we haven't heard from E.T. because of a prime directive. So I'm not a Star Trek fan. I've never seen any episodes, but apparently in Star Trek, um, there is something called a prime directive. So he equates this in this article by saying that the prime directive is, you don't, you know, that the prime directive from the alien superiors is that you don't want to interfere in the evolution of alien societies, even if you have good intentions. So in other words, they stay on the, in the boundaries, they stay on the outside. Uh, This is kind of the zoo hypothesis. So we're kind of the zoo. You know, if we go to the zoo, if you've been to the zoo, you take a look at the animals that are there, but you don't interfere. You know, you just basically leave them alone to exist in the uh, environment and the conditions that that they are in. So this is what's called the prime directive. So the third, the third reason is, um, he, and he starts it by saying, how can we be sure we are not just an ET's simulation? So again, kind of a hologram. And in other words, we're, we're simply the toy or maybe the experiment of some very, very, very advanced ET that's actually, we're just simply a, um, again, a simulation of whatever they're trying to learn in, in their laboratories or in their classrooms. So because they don't, they can't interfere there because Obviously, that would mess up the simulation. So that's the third reason. Fourth reason Young Lin Ma gives for no contact with ETs is the very famous berserker hypothesis. So basically what it says is that um, the aliens invented these machines, these uh, AI, to go out and, um, you know, find, find us. However, the AI turned their backs on these aliens and destroyed the aliens. And now these little, you know, AIs are out there trying to destroy everything in sight. Uh, So basically, you know, we haven't seen them because, you know, essentially they are out and about trying to destroy anything, but we're not, we're not even worth destroying. Um, But if we do encounter them, it's probably not going to go well for us. Another, another theory, number five here is a very, very uh, famous, and I kind of talked about it in my t- uh, Paranormal Nothing podcast episode where I talked about the Fermi paradox, is this theory called the astivation. I hope I'm saying it correctly, or astivation or astivation hypothesis. And basically it says is that aliens are sleeping. Uh, so we don't want to wake a sleeping giant. They're sleeping, and they're just waiting for potentially some big transition phase in the universe. So this assumes that these aliens or these ETs are extremely advanced, that they can actually hibernate in some way, or they can go into some kind of uh, low power mode uh, where they are, they're simply waiting for either the universe to end uh, or they're waiting for us to reach some level of advanced knowledge that we can actually uh, communicate with them and relate to them. So in the meantime, they're asleep. What's another theory? Number six. Um, basically, Young Lin Ma says that we haven't heard from them because there are very few aliens out there. 
So what does that mean? That's another theory that is sometimes called the rare earth hypothesis. So basically it says that even though the universe is ginormously big and is full of stars and those stars have planets and some of those planets are earth-like and some of those earth-like planets may have life, that's very rare. So in other words, the statistics don't necessarily work for earth-like planets in the universe. Uh, so because of that, uh, you know, earth is very, very privileged, earth, earth is very unique, and it's not necessarily going to be, there, there isn't going to be many earths like we would assume uh, there is. So that's, that's the reason we haven't met aliens. Number seven. So number seven is another very famous, uh, and I, I kind of like this one the most because it seems, it just has a cool title. It's called The Great Filter. So what does that mean? It simply means that um, there is some hypothetical great filter in the universe where if a civilization has not reached this particular level, um, what they call the Kardashev scale, Kardashev level, and a, Kar a Kardashev scale is simply a scale of um, how advanced a civilization is. So there's type, there's like type one, type two, type three, and it could actually go beyond. I believe humanity is like type one and a half. So we are very at the bottom of the totem pole. So this great filter, this hypothetical great filter, this kind of uh, rite of passage, we need to pass through a particular rite of passage as a civilization in order to continue progressing in a logarithmic scale. If we do not pass this uh, filter at this point in our civilization, then chances are we either will destroy ourselves, or we will uh, basically eat up all our natural resources in our home planet uh, and not move on. So basically it's saying that there is no other ETs because no other ETs pass the test. That's called the Great Filter. I like I really like that one because I like the name and it makes a lot of sense because you see it here on Earth. I mean, we're we're basically eating ourselves alive, unfortunately. Um, you know, I'm recording this podcast uh, a couple days after um, this horrible, horrible shooting in Texas. Um, it's an example that you know if we were to go through the Great Filter, I don't know if we'll make it. So that's again number seven. Number eight. Number eight is space aliens could be watching us. So it's kind of similar to this uh, zoo hypothesis. Um, so what's the difference? Let me just read it verbatim. It says space aliens could, could in fact be watching us using the methods we use to spot exoplanets. But if they are technologically advanced, wouldn't they be here by now? So it's called the Hart Tipler Conjecture is of course very unpopular in science fiction, but let's confront it, if only to move on to more promising speculations. So in other words, it's just basically saying they're watching us, um, but again, they maybe they are not technologically advanced enough to actually visit us. So that's a little bit different, right? We're not, we're essentially there, you know, maybe uh, with them, but we're not necessarily in the zoo where they're watching us. Number nine is kind of similar to the great filter to an extent. And basically it's saying that there's a very, there's a brief window for ET to find us. Uh, and it's called the brief window hypothesis. In other words, a civilization um, will be advanced enough to search for other civilizations only during a brief window. And either we are not at that window or the, the window for some other civilization is not there yet, and we need to. And there needs to be a one-to-one -one match. Otherwise, you know, we'll never find each other. So we just haven't passed through that window, or either we or we missed it. So that's that's kind of called the uh, brief window hypothesis. And number ten is verbatim. It says, "What if we don't see aliens because they have not evolved yet?" So this is kind of uh, what what they like to call the firstborn hypothesis, meaning that we are actually more intelligent than aliens. Uh, I recently finished reading the uh, um, this very famous book called The Sparrow, where it talks about a group of uh, Jesuit priests that go to a planet 
uh, Rakat uh, in another star system, actually, uh, Alpha Centauri star, star system, in order to meet uh, E.T., who's there. And when they get there, E.T. is actually very, very, not as intelligent as humans, but it just happens to be that there are two species of E.T. living on that planet. One intelligent, very intelligent, and one that's not so much. So this theory is saying that maybe we haven't heard from E.T. because all E.T.s out there are not so intelligent as us and therefore have not maybe uh, reached a level of intelligence where they've actually created uh, technology to communicate. Another reason, number 11, and we're almost at the end here, is that aliens have not ex do not exist because they've evolved into virtual reality literally at a nanoscale. This is kind of called the transcension hypothesis. So you're familiar with the singularity about, um, you know, transferring your hypoth your uh, sorry your conscious into another being or another object or into the web into data um, this this type of theory is very very uh, popular also now because of you know Raymond Kurzweil the uh, singularity and those types of things so it's saying that maybe aliens have already reached that singularity and therefore have transferred their consciousness and they've actually gone nano right so there's no reason for us to meet them because we are not at that level. It's kind of far-fetched to think that, but, you know, that, that is a theory. Another theory that's kind of a very interesting one, too, is that uh, intelligent li life in the universe is actually living interior oceans of planets and moons. So it's kind of, if, you've, if you're familiar with that, that theory that there's a hollow Earth or that there are the narrows and the darrows, that there are actually beings living within the earth that are coexisting with us. So this theory is kind of like that, where it's saying that there are other planets out there where, and we know that there are water worlds for sure, um, and we know that there are all kinds of worlds, right? you know, even worlds made of diamonds, uh, but that some of these worlds, there's actually intelligent life living in its oceans or in the interior of that planet, maybe because of the plate tectonics, um, Within that planet, it's a nice, comfy place to live in, whereas on the on the surface, it is not. Um, again, it would be very hard to prove that, but it is a theory. That's why we haven't met them, because they're just basically inside their home planets. So number 13 is what's called the percolation hypothesis. And it says, is real-world space travel just too daunting for ET? In other words, they cannot overcome the laws of physics any more than we can. So in other words, they're basically at the same level we are, maybe even less. And because of that, uh, they can't make contact with us because we ourselves, for example, cannot make contact. Uh, we can't take a photo, for example, of an exoplanet's surface at the moment. We don't have that technology. We're getting there, but we don't have it quite yet. Um, you know, so that type of communication, we're not there yet. So maybe they're not there yet either, whoever they are. And lastly, the last, very last item that that uh, just uh, Young Lin Ma talks about uh, in terms of why we have not seen aliens or been contacted is something called the Aurora Hypothesis. And basically what it is, is that E.T. could risk only rare contact with us. So in other words... It's not a norm to contact other civilizations. It's very rare that ETs would want to contact us. So I, I kind of equate this to some kind of, uh, you know, very indigenous tribe living on Earth, and uh, they like their privacy. So very rarely would they contact a civilized or a, let's say, a third world country or a third world group um, in case may maybe only if they really needed it, uh, some type of medical emergency or... Uh, some other kind of emergency, but otherwise they would want to be left alone. Um, so maybe ET is the same way. You know, there's really no reason for them to con They're aware of our existence, but there's no reason for them to contact us because a multiple, multiple reasons why they might not want to contact us. So that brings me to the end here. 14 reasons why, uh, according to this data scientist, ET has not contacted us. What's my favorite? Well, I think you kind of know if you listen to this episode, it's the great filter. I think we're not there yet. A lot of times growing up, you know, I would kind of think about this, this question. Why haven't we contacted? Why haven't we been contacted by ET? 
Now, I know there is a topic of UFOs. These are not, UFOs is not a, I guess, a consideration in this case, since Fermi is, is, a, is a theory that's, I guess you could base it on real science, although now the lines are blurring between, you know, UAP, UFOs, and real science with all the different stuff going on in, in, uh, in the media. But, you know, not talking about UFOs, when we're talking about actually observing and communicating with an intelligent life form that's potentially living on another planet, we have not gotten there, um, obviously, as of today, 526. But w when I was a kid, like I said, I used to think about why why haven't we? And the thing that made the most sense to me, because again, I, I believe in God and you know I'm, I'm Catholic, as I mentioned before, I like to think that we weren't ready. Um, that's the reason why we have not met, you know, our, our brother E.T., our sister E.T. And the reason being is because, you know, it just, it's not the right time. Um, only God knows when that time would, would come uh, when we ourselves, in terms of our conscious, in terms of our spirit, in terms of our morality, in terms of our character, when it is that we would be ready to meet E.T., then at that point it would happen. So, I, I don't think that any one of those explanations kind of considers the spiritual aspect of why we haven't gotten our answer to the Fermi paradox, but that was kind of my answer because I just felt that, you know, if we did meet E.T. and if we didn't knew that E.T. existed at, at the wrong point of our existence, of our um, trajectory, would have caused quite a few things. I mean, look what happened with COVID. Uh, look what happened with uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, quite a bit mayhem and chaos ensued. Uh, a lot of people's characters came to light during this type of emergency. So that's the reason why I felt that maybe, you know, once once we're ready, then, you know, God knows the time. We will know. We will know if uh, we're alone. And um, I'm 100% certain that we're not. And the reason is because just it's, I like, again, I, I like the hypothesis of space is just huge. Space is huge, and um, second of all, we know that there are Earth-like planets around Sun-like stars, and uh, statistics and probability tells us, so apologies for that dog barking in the background here, statistics and probability tells us that chances of us being alone are zero. Uh, just it, There's too many, too many chances for us not to be alone. So I hope you've enjoyed today's podcast, which is more of a review of this article and kind of delving into the Fermi Paradox again. Uh, hopefully I can put out another podcast soon, maybe in this nature, shorter, uh, more to the point, and uh, focusing on one topic. Thank you again. Hope everybody stays safe. And as always, question everything.